So you do have a study guide, and most usually, I don't like to just do one side of a sheet of paper. I like to have it uh, with uh, uh, the other side taken up as well. But uh, this time, I, I knew that if I didn't give you something to read uh, uh, with uh, some of these definitions and, uh, and points that I'm trying to make, that I would be looking at a lot of furrowed brows out there. What's this guy trying to say? Uh, because uh, this hopefully is going to be a little deeper, a little more advanced, uh, and so forth with regard to this teaching. Now, uh, as we're approaching this subject of perceptions, uh, we have a, a little note there regarding the categories. All categories of perceptions uh, fall under what we're uh, talking about here. But uh, because we're trying to focus in on spiritual things and doctrinal things, uh, that's uh, mainly uh, what we're going to use them for with regard to references. But we're talking about perceptions, talking about spiritual and doctrinal perceptions. Uh, I, don't, um, I don't know about you, but um, there are a whole lot of perceptions out there. Uh, just read a book by a fellow by the name of Friedman. And uh, this guy, uh, uh, though he's unsaved and he is a globalist, he is a, very, he is a genius and very adept uh, at what's going on in the world today. And uh, the title of the book was um, The Lexus, or The Connection, and The Olive Tree. And uh, the olive tree, of course, he says is something that we all have. Uh, he has been over in Israel and Lebanon and in the, the, the Middle East as a journalist. Uh, and he understands about the olive tree in Israel and the land. And so he uses that as a symbol for all of us. We all need roots. We all need a place to call home. We all need a place to go back to that we're familiar with, we can call our own and so forth. And that is the olive tree. But the problem, he says, is that with technology, comes globalization and a Lexus or a link to all parts of the world. So that with this link, our olive trees are threatened. Uh, and uh, this book was just written recently uh, and uh, uh, it, it was looking towards such things as layoffs. Have you looked at the companies that are laying off? We're not talking about 500 or 1,000. We're talking about 5,000, 10,000, 26,000, and, and so forth around the world. And uh, sometimes right here in our area, it gets affected. Uh, GE up in Bloomington just uh, closed the plant there and sent all the jobs to Mexico. And this man contends that. Uh, this is part of the problem of globalization, that uh, immediately, within seconds, a company can put out bids for work around the world and get back uh, the, the cheapest bidder. And they're going to send their money to those areas of, of the world uh, where they can um, get their product done for the least amount of labor expense. But then he says, no, that's the kicker. Because what happens to our olive tree? They get threatened. Uh, because somebody else's olive tree down there gets, uh, gets the money, he likens that to, to water and, and food and, and shelter and roots. Uh, people have to get uprooted and move and, and that sort of thing uh, because of this uh, speed. And he says it's no longer the, the, the bigger eats the smaller. He said it's the faster that eats the slower. If you do not keep up, if, if, if in an instant when they click on your website and you cannot give them what they need in just a short period of time, he says all they'll do is click off and go to the next one and find the one that can. Now, the problem with that as we are relating these things is perceptions. Uh, perceptions have to do in our definition here with an acquired understanding of something. You understand it in a certain way. But now the problem with perceptions is that they can be right or wrong. But when you have this Lexus, here you are in your olive tree in your own little corner of the world, but you've got this link to the world, you have not just the connections round about in your community to, to deal with, you now have an infiltration of ideas, competitors around the world. And uh, that's what's happening uh, today in the realm of the spiritual and the doctrinal. 
Uh, today, there are probably a lot of people who have clicked on a website and have had their church at home uh, because some pastor doesn't understand the, uh, the Greek language, which says that it's face-to-face -face teaching with a God-called, demonic gifted pastor teacher that is God's will for this dispensation. And you don't get it in front of, of a, a tube unless it becomes necessary that, that the first and foremost, the priority of God is face to face, if at all possible. But now, uh, everybody and their brother has a, a religious opinion. Everybody and their brother's on a website. And we're getting bombarded with the media with different kinds of perceptions. And sometimes I know myself, I get, I get weary. Because no sooner than I think I've got one perception <laughs> to, you know, taught here with the, the people, uh, our own folks, then something else comes up and we're, cut, we're bombarded from this area and this area. And it is a fight. It really is. It is a battle for the minds of men. Because it is my conviction that there is only truly one way of viewing a thing. And that is God's way. Uh, and when you get all of these different types of perceptions, and then people listen to this and listen to the other, and it, it becomes confusing in the mind, the, the doctrine of mingled seeds and mingled uh, doctrines, uh, people don't know what to do, and they get discouraged. And that's why we're here we attempt so um, uh, desperately to get the, the truth. But let's look at some perceptions here. Now, verse number nine, in Matthew 13, I'm going to use an example of, first of all, of Christ and his parable. You see, with the parables, you can go both ways with perceptions. Uh, and the Lord Jesus Christ says, who hath the ears, verse number nine, to hear, let him hear. Now, what he's talking about is all of his people had ears. All of them there could hear. There were no deaf people in the crowd. So when he made this statement, he was talking about the fact that he's going to say something and that you really need to hear it. Have you ever said that to somebody? Well, I hear you. Meaning, not that you didn't hear the words, but that you perceived it correctly. You understood what he was talking about. And that's what Jesus is saying. If you've got ears, understand what I'm saying. The disciples came to him and said, why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered and said to them, because it's given you to know the mysteries, but to them it's not given. And the reason it was not given is they didn't want to know it. They could have, but they didn't want to know it. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and who have more in abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away even that which he has. Therefore speak I to them in uh, parables, he said, uh, because they seeing, see not, and hearing, hear not, neither do they understand. Jesus Christ was talking to them, and he was teaching spiritual truths, but they didn't comprehend it. Uh, they were thinking he was meaning something totally different. Their perception was wrong. But for those who wanted to know the truth, guess what? It's very easy to understand. They should have understood it. And he's going to explain it here in just a little bit. Uh, because they had a spiritual mindset or frame of reference, they understood what he was talking about. Verse number, um, uh, the last part of verse 14. And seeing they should hear and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes have they closed, and at any time they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, should understand with their heart, and I should convert them. You see, if they wanted to understand, they could have understood, but instead, they kept a different perception in their mind. This guy just can't be telling you the truth. Why do I need to believe this guy? If I believe this guy, I'm going to have to do thus and so, thus and so. And uh, I, so they, they understood a thing in a certain way to prevent their having to be responsible for the truth. So, verse number 18, he says then, Hear, therefore, the parable of the sower. In verse 19, he says, When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understands it not. They could understand it. They had all the scriptures available in this historic context. Uh, they could have figured it out. It was, it was very easy. And that's what he was doing, likening these things to the kingdom. Uh, they should have seen the correlation. They should have seen the parallel. But instead, because they didn't want to believe the truth, they maintained an erroneous perception. 
He that hears the word of the kingdom doesn't understand it. Then comes the wicked one and catches away that which was sown in his heart. But, note verse number 23. But he that receives seed into the good ground. Now the good ground is, I'm ready for the truth. I'm ripe for the picking. I'm ready for the planting. Uh, all you have to do is put the seed there and it's going to take root and, uh, and something's going to grow that God is going to sanction. So it says here, uh, verse 23. He that receives seed into the good ground is he that hears the word and understands it and it bears uh, fruit and brings forth fruit. So perceptions are absolutely important. Uh, and with all of us here, all of us have opinions, all of us have perceptions, all of us have a background. The struggle of a pastor teacher is to get all of us thinking alike. To be like-minded. Did you, you realize that is my job? To, to come together and to have us to be like-minded. This is, thus saith the Lord, this is what God says, this is accurate the doctrine, this is what we should believe and embrace. But that's, that's difficult. Why? Because every single moment of every single day until we get here, we're bombarded with false perceptions regarding spirituality, the gospel, the truth, uh, and those sort of things that it makes your job a little bit uh, more difficult. Let's go to verse 36. There, he says, Jesus sent the multitude away. Uh, they, were, they were kind of kind of a little slow here with this parable business. Uh, and uh, so he went to, to the house and his disciples came to him. And uh, these guys should have understood it. Declare unto us the parable of uh, the tares of the field. And we have discussed that before. You have the wheat, you have the tares, the tares are the children of the wicked one, the wheat of the, you know, and the tares are going to be taken and burned, the wheat is going to be brought into the barn, and that is, here's the kingdom. The tares are unbelievers, they're not going to get the kingdom, but uh, the, the uh, believing the Jews and Gentiles under this program will be brought into the kingdom. So you come to verse number 56. Excuse me, 51 is what I want to stop 51. So that Jesus said to them, after he's done teaching in these parables and explaining to them, they wanted to know and they figured it out. He said this to them, have ye understood all these things? They said unto him, yes, Lord. They had one perception before Jesus taught. After he taught using these uh, uh, techniques, they had another perception of things. They saw it. The light bulb went on. They figured it out. Uh, they understood it. When the whole multitude, and especially the religious leaders, came to him and he taught, they heard the very same thing, but they went away with a different perception. That he was a false teacher. He didn't have the truth. Yeah, he was in it for himself and, and so forth. Now let's turn it back to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Here we have a fellow who wants to get saved under the kingdom program. Uh, this uh, gentleman and the one who leads into Christ are not in the body of Christ, but they are associated with the nation of Israel and the kingdom program. But salvation is still uh, the objective of both programs, to get people into a saving relationship with God through uh, um, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So it says in verse number 26, the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, and uh, saying, Arise, go to the south uh, from Jerusalem uh, to uh, Gaza, which is dead. He arose, and behold, an Ethiopian, eunuch of great authority, Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. Um, and we've discussed uh, Candace and the Ethiopians and how they've been evangelized and how they've turned from uh, at this point uh, back to uh, Islam. He was returning from the, the day of Pentecost, but he was sitting in his chariot reading Isaiah the prophet. The Spirit said to Philip, go near and join yourself uh, to the chariot. So Philip ran and heard him read the prophet Isaiah. Now here's what he asked. Now mind you, this guy is reading the word of God. 
And this is a point uh, that we hammer home here constantly about rightly dividing the word of truth. He was reading the Bible, but coming up with another perception. Uh, how does this relate to me? Uh, what, is, what is important here with regard to uh, my life and my eternal relationship with God? So what is the first question that he asked this Ethiopian eunuch? Understandest thou what you read? How do you perceive this? You're reading these things, but do you really comprehend the significance of what's going on? Now, uh, beforehand, let me give you some background. The Ethiopian eunuch was there in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit of God fell on the kingdom believers in the upper room and they came out speaking in tongues. He had heard the gospel proclaimed by Peter or one, one of the uh, uh, other uh, 119 uh, people that were up in the upper room that he had heard this gospel. So he turned back here to, to Isaiah the prophet and he's trying to sort it all together. And uh, the guy said, how can I uh, understand it except some man should guide me? He desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Okay, now look, uh, 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 you, you've got the answers here? Uh, I'm, I'm open. The place of the scriptures which he read was, he was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and the land like a lamb dumb before his shear, so open uh, he not his mouth. And it goes on to, to talk about that. Know what, the, uh, uh, what Jesus did on the cross, the verse 34. The eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaks the prophet? Of himself or another man? There was his perception. He read the, the, the prophet and said, Who in the world is like this lamb? Who has been led uh, like a lamb to the slaughter? Who in the world is he talking about? Now, the eunuch should have understood, having heard Peter preach the, uh, the gospel in the, in the tongue there. Uh, but uh, know what Philip says. Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. He gave him the proper understanding of that verse of scripture. The man had one perception. He was looking at it from, from one point of view, which was absolutely wrong. The prophet wasn't talking about himself. And Philip says, let me bring you up today. Here's what Jesus did. He died on the cross, uh, he, was, he was judged, uh, he was rejected of his people, he rose again, and now you're supposed to believe on him, and which he ultimately did. Let's go to Romans chapter 2. <coughs> Romans chapter 2 and verse number 15. Now, Everybody in their life struggles with proper perceptions. Especially with regard as we are limiting this to spiritual things or doctrinal issues. But you know that we have believed here in the steps that lead to salvation or the rejection of Christ so that every person becomes fully accountable uh, to God for either accepting or rejecting Christ. So you come to God consciousness, Unless, of course, they die beforehand. God consciousness, um, the age of accountability, and then gospel hearing. But during the, the process, there's a whole lot of misperceptions or uh, wanting to believe certain things apart from the truth. People today, and you know, we're into self-esteem. Nobody wants to think themselves a sinner. My word. I'm not a sinner. I'm a good person. Why do I need Christ? Uh, uh, you know, I've done good. And so that's what Paul is saying here, verse number 15. It shows the work of the law, especially the moral aspect of it, written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile. Notice their perception. I am a sinner, and I need Christ to save you, accusing one another. You know, there was a time in my life when I had to come to that realization. I could not save myself. I wasn't good enough to save myself. There was not any religious program that could save me. It wasn't church membership, it wasn't baptism, it wasn't catechism. Uh, it wasn't anything but simple, pure faith in the Son of God. But it had to, uh, I had to say something about myself. <laughs> that I'm a sinner and can't save myself. I accused myself. Um, and by the way, you got saved and you know what? You did the very same thing. You don't get saved without it. 
You don't get saved without a proper perception about who and what you are outside of Christ. So the guilty sinner hopelessly lost. Or, and but here's what the most of the world does. They want their self-esteem. Last part of verse 15, they excuse one another. I'm not so bad. I don't need this. Why do I need that? I'd have to, you know, go to church and study the word and, and, uh, and uh, you know, give my money and all this uh, business. Uh, and, and so they excuse themselves. That's their perception. So you have two perceptions about yourself. One is right and one is wrong. You can either go on in your sin and unbelief uh, and uh, excusing yourself from being a sinner, or you can take a good hard look at the spiritual mirror and say, here's what I say. Uh, I am, I'm undone, I am lost, and I need Christ alone to save me. So let's go to 1 Corinthians then. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Here's the real significance of this verse. Verse number 14. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, their foolishness unto him. It's his perception, is it? The Spirit of God has one way of looking at salvation. It centers around the person of Christ and his righteousness, and it centers in us in our unrighteousness. Uh, and is one, one frame of reference to give all of mankind for a common understanding in what's called common grace and, and beyond. One, one doctrinal thing. But as far as the natural man is concerned, it's, um, it's the deer in the headlights, you know. It's, uh, look, the, the lights are on, but nobody's home. Or the lights are on, but the rheostat's turned way down low, you know. Uh, just can't perceive it. I don't understand it. What are you talking about? The Christ and doctrine and spirituality and so forth. The natural man doesn't understand it. Neither can he know them. As long as he maintains that mindset. As long as he perceives it the way of the world. Uh, the way that Lucifer is leading him. He's never going to understand it. He has to acquire another perception. Another frame of reference. They are spiritually discerned. Now this doctrine of perception has been something I've been working on for the longest time. And I've got some of the various points here and I wanted to make sure I get the Bible concepts and verses that will illustrate them. And, and uh, even now I'm not totally satisfied with it because I perceive myself in one way I'm a perfectionist. And uh, probably if the Holy Spirit absolutely led me like the scriptures, I still would not be satisfied. I'm just speaking tongue-in-cheek. I'm, I'm being facetious here, of course. Let's go back to John 8. To just, just see myself. This is the infallible Word of God that the pastor is writing. And he's still... Well, Spirit, don't you think this would be there? Oh, well, I'm glad he's responsible and not me. And of course, I have never written the inspired, infallible, inherent Word of God, but I do teach it. John chapter 8, we're under point 2 here of definitions, an objective reality. See, been grappling with this, these things because of, of ideas. And so we're going to contrast here two realities. One that is something that exists as absolute truth and reality outside of your mind, and something that exists as, 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 a, as a reality, subjective reality, and relative truth inside your mind. Now, uh, we're then going to go to what's, what we call the reality confluence, where when you got saved, that's what happened. Subjectively in your mind, you came to embrace that was an absolute truth about Jesus Christ. And absolute truth and objective reality became the status quo of your soul. But only when those two come together. Only when you believed the gospel. Other than that, you believed other things subjectively uh, that, were, that were not true regarding spiritual things in the Word of God. Did, did that mean that these things did not exist? No. Does that mean that, that your thinking was valid as, uh, because you didn't think the truth? No, no. Uh, that which is outside of your mind remained valid. It's the word of God. It's absolute truth. That which was inside of your mind, though contrary and real to you, 
was still not the way God saw it, and therefore is totally subjective, it's totally concocted, totally made up. So here we are in John, chapter 8, verse number 32. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, what does that mean? Here we go with the, the two models again. <coughs> Did they know something? <coughs> well, sure. Everybody knows something, just ask them. Everybody's got this opinion. But know what Jesus said. You will know the truth, which means they didn't know it prior to what he told it. You see? Yeah, you know some things, but you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. It's two different perceptions. One is still real in your soul. That's subjective reality. That's relative truth. It's the way you think about it. But here's the way it really is. This is what God says about it. And so therefore, they had to adjust their perception or forever remain confused in the realm of the spiritual and the doctrinal. They had to adjust it. And therefore, there is something known as a right perception in these areas and categories. Uh, and Jesus himself is the one who documents this truth. You shall know the truth. They didn't know it, but if you know it, it's the truth that's going to set you free. Not what you think in your heart, however sincere it is. It's how God says it is. That is the truth that you must perceive, comprehend, and embrace uh, to make it valid. Go to chapter 17. John chapter 17. And verse number 17. Sanctify them, says Christ. I realize we're using uh, those portions of Scripture that are designated for kingdom believers, but the principle is the same. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Up until this time, we're all natural men who can't understand the things of God, the things of the Spirit of God. They're spiritually discerned. God has to, in common grace, give us this uh, ability and this perception for us to, uh, to understand it and begin uh, following it. Well, where does this perception come from? Where is the truth? Note, thy word is truth. Verse number 19. And for their sakes I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Sanctification is the, uh, the adoption of the uh, divine viewpoint to life. You don't think like the world. You think different from Lucifer and all those associated with him. They have one perception, they have one mindset, but you come to the Word of God and you believe it and you adopt another one. Yes, it's opposing to theirs, that's true. Uh, yes, theirs is wrong, that's true. But yours was wrong before you adopted the other. So you can't be too hard on them. Uh, uh, but then again, if they uh, want to get saved, they've got to adopt the right one. Let's uh, move on uh, back then to Psalms 119. Psalms 119. Verse 104. This tremendous verse documenting just what I'm talking about here in our study. Now, what we are doing is looking through point two in objective reality. It's the sum total of all things possessing actuality, existence, essence, authenticity in the realm of unchanging absolute truth found outside of one's mind. When you uh, were conceived and born and you grew, grew up, all spiritual truth was outside of your mind. It was, it was kept in the Word of God. You came to understand it from outside sources in. Uh, then you have the reality confluence where you embraced it and at that point believed it so that the two became one in your soul. However, uh, all absolute uh, truth and objective reality is outside because man is a sinner. And it has to be brought in through the proclamation of the gospel or the word. Note verse 104. Through thy precepts, I get understanding. I get perception. Therefore, I hate every false way. The false way is a misperception on the essential things of, of spirituality and eternal life. 
Now, you know, the psalmist uh, here is, is saying misperceptions are a bad thing. Yes, that's true. We all have the right to believe what we want to believe, but that does not make them valid or truth, and that doesn't set you right with God. God has an understanding, and your precepts, through them, I get the understanding. It's God's way of thinking. It's God's way of doing it. It's not how I make it to be. It's how He says it to be. So though in America we have a right to misperceptions if we want, but in God's economy, it's either His way or the highway, period. And that's, that's what this is teaching. There's one way to view it. That's, that's how God says it. All right? Uh, uh, come uh, with me to verse 130. And so, here's how objective reality gets into a soul filled with subjective reality. The entrance of thy words give light. And the, that light is uh, uh, synonymous with perception. It gives understanding to the simple. And believe you me, and I'm speaking, including myself in the group, before we got saved, we were all simpletons. We didn't have it. We were void and vacuous in the realm of the soul with anything that uh, was valuable regarding eternity, spirituality, and doctrine. We had to get it from an outside source. Why? Because of subject of reality, which was the soul. Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. Now, just like with objective reality, found outside of the mind, it's always right, it's never wrong, and its truth is always absolute, does not change. The subject of reality is the sum total of all things possessing actuality, existence, essence, authenticity, in the realm of the changing and relative truth found inside one's mind. So, yes, before you are enlightened, before you perceive it, you do have a perception, but it's, it's always subjective. Uh, and it's always relative. It's, it's changing. Uh, and um, that's another thing with regard to, um, to what the, this man said in his books, very, very perceptive. Uh, all of us want our olive trees. We don't want to change. And so we're experiencing a tension between our connection and competition with the rest of the world and the fact that we want our olive trees to be planted and right where we left them to stay there uh, from here on out. And the fact is there, there's the tension there because of the competition and, and what, the, what is happening in this globalization uh, process. But we feel that, that tension as well. And the reason we feel that tension is because we teach unchanging eternal truths and the world is being flooded with subjectivity. And in subjectivity, what is in one day is out the next. We were talking about that with the workplace standards. Now it's you're not supposed to sit at a desk, you're supposed to stand. And somebody's, a, you know, made, made this, a, you know, next year it'll be, now, now you go back to sitting again. Uh, and you have, you're supposed to wear this to the workplace, now you're supposed to wear that to the workplace. It's always changing because people are bored and they've got to come up with something to do to justify their existence and, and uh, put in their time. But it's always changing. There's nothing set. Let me tell you, I trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. It was the same but when I was age 19 that is now when I'm this age. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you're awake. <laughs> you're awake. Did you calculate this out, weren't you? Uh, all right. Matthew 9. Uh, he entered into a ship, passed over, came to his own city. And behold, they brought him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. Jesus, seeing their face, said to the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. And uh, behold, certain of the scribes said, No, within themselves. <laughs> Subjective perception. Well, this man blasphemes. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? Now see, here's Jesus Christ. He had the right perspective and perception on things. He understood what they were thinking, and he said, uh, Your perception's wrong. Uh, here I am. I have just healed this man and forgiven his sins. 
Now, if these men really knew the Old Testament, they would have known that because of Israel's unbelief, God said, I will put all of these diseases on you. You will turn back to God and I will forgive you and I'll put all these diseases on your enemy. And so what that is tantamount to is forgiveness of sins. You come back to me, I'll forgive you and put all these diseases on your enemies. That's Israel's program. But see, they were again uh, uh, non-doctrinal, very, very uh, religious, but not very shallow in their, in their thinking. So Jesus said, you're thinking evil. What's easier to say? Your sins be forgiven you or arise and walk? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's the same difference. Uh, if your sins are forgiven, that means according to the kingdom, the curse is removed. Get up and walk or rise, get up and walk because your sins are forgiven. Now, this is in miniature what's going to happen to the entire uh, nation of believing Israelites. God's, God's going to let them in the kingdom and remove the curse. They're going to get up and walk for, for God. And there's the picture. But these religionists had the foggiest. Why? Because of their perception. They were thinking incorrectly. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And he arose and departed and went to his house. So um, when the multitude saw it, they glorified God for the power. Jesus Christ had the power to either forgive sins or heal the man. And the fact is, they were synonymous. And so if you understood doctrine, which these men didn't, they had a wrong perception. His was right. Theirs was wrong. All right, well, let's go to Luke 7. I'm, I'm certainly glad that we do have installed this series of lights back here because for every preacher, there is a misperception of time. <laughs> if that wouldn't keep me on the street and narrow, uh, just like the rest of them, I would probably run astray. Uh, though when we did uh, use this down at the conference, there were some who saw the light but uh, didn't, didn't perceive it. <laughs> it. It didn't apply to them. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Okay, Luke 7. Uh, verse number 36. One of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. He went to the Pharisee's house. He sat down to meet. And the woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, a very expensive thing, uh, and stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with the tears, wiped them with the hairs of her head, kissed his feet, anointed them with ointment. But uh, this, uh, this old Pharisee, uh, when he uh, saw uh, 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 what was done, he spoke within himself. Now here's another perception. Okay, this guy is such a holy Joe. Uh, this guy is in with God. Well, he would have known the character of this particular woman and he wouldn't have let her touch him because ceremonial uncleanness. Now, you know, little did he know that Jesus Christ would forgive her of sin and make her clean, as the Bible says, every withhold from the inside out. Uh, but uh, that doesn't matter. They just uh, uh, don't want her uh, touching them. So this man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she's a sinner. And Jesus said unto him, now you can imagine here, Simon, <laughs> Uh, I've got the gift of discernment. The book of Isaiah said I would have it when the Spirit of God came on me. And uh, I have something to say to you. I can read your mind, Simon. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. Now he's going to give a parable to give him the perception that he needs. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed him 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? So, it's between Visa and MasterCard. <laughs> for some of you ladies. <laughs> you're looking for forgiveness. And one of them you're going to appreciate more than the other, for sure. And uh, you, you understand the perception. All right. Simon said, well, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said, you judge rightly. You got it. 
Uh, you got the picture. Uh, and he turned to the woman and said, Seest thou this woman? I entered to your house. You gave me no water for my feet. She washed my feet with her tears, wiped them with the hairs of her head. You gave me no kiss, which was customary in, in uh, the Middle Eastern uh, countries. Uh, but since this woman came in, she has not uh, ceased to kiss my feet. Not the cheek, you know, the cheek to, to cheek here, uh, but the face. She's kissing my feet in, in, a, in a, an act of respect and worship and, and, um, and uh, honor. My head you didn't anoint with oil. And these were all customary things for uh, a host to do to an invited guest like this Pharisee was. He didn't do it, but the woman came in and she, she didn't. Uh, she, uh, I mean, she did it rather. And so it says, Wherefore I say to you, meaning the woman, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. And he said to her, your sins are uh, forgiven. Um, and then they said within themselves again, who is this that forgives sins? And he just, he just d disregarded their misperception and said this to the woman, your faith saved you. You got it. And these guys with all of their knowledge and all of their religiosity and all of their uh, self-righteousness don't uh, understand. But you've, you've understood your faith has saved you and, and so forth. So, uh, they had subjective reality. They thought about it in a certain way, but it was different than how God thought about it. Now, this uh, particular study that we're gonna be doing is, and as we're running out of time here, we'll start there uh, tonight, with the reality confluence. And that just simply means that the way God solves our perception problems is to give us the right perception. And we can understand it, and we have a choice. When we believe it, there is a merger or a confluence. Just like when rivers come together and so forth, they call that a, a confluence. Two things are brought together, two forces. You've got the, the subjectivity of your mind and the objectivity of the truth to be brought together so that the subjective and the objective become one. And, uh, and what is in your soul at that moment is sanctioned of God.